I represent 18 women who were deceived into long-term intimate sexual relationships with undercover officers, two women who were deceived into long-term close friendships, which became sexual on more than one occasion, one woman who was deceived into a close long-term friendship. The earliest of these relationships began in 1985 and the most recent ended in 2015. So that's four years after the scandal came to light. I appear together with Ruth Brander and the solicitors firms who are representing my clients are Bernberg Pierce, Hickman and Rose and Hodge Jones and Allen. So you've received a written opening statement from us, which as I understand it is now available on the inquiry website. Um, and that document is one which includes far more detail than I am able to give this morning. Uh, in particular, it includes details of each relationship uh, that my clients had with an undercover officer. In my oral submissions today, I am going to touch on those in the briefest of ways. I'm going to focus instead in detail on the common issues and themes that the written statement addresses. But I will tell you in much more detail about one case in particular, and that's Rosa's case, because the women consider it important that you and the public more widely hear at least one detailed account of how appallingly the women have been abused. In total, there are now more than 30 women who know that they were deceived into such relationships by undercover police officers spying on campaign groups. Other women are represented separately in the inquiry and you will hear from Heather Williams later this afternoon in relation to her clients. At least one of those relationships, that of Mary and Rick Gibson, dates all the way back to 1975. It's very likely that there are other women who have yet to discover that they were affected. The inquiry itself has led to a number of, number of women, including six of those that I represent, discovering that relationships which they had always believed to have been significant and genuine were in fact police infiltrations. There may be other women in the same position who don't yet know. And the extensive anonymity granted by the inquiry to officers, including of their cover names, means that these women will continue to be denied the truth and thereby prevented from giving relevant evidence, so hampering the ability of the inquiry to get to the truth about the frequency, the nature and the scale of these abuses. Most of the women who were deceived were involved to some degree or other with political or campaigning activities. Activities challenging oppression, challenging injustice, seeking a better, more sustainable world. Such political freedom of speech and protest, as others have said before me on behalf of non-state core participants, but which it is vital to repeat and drive home, is the bedrock of democratic societies across the world. It's protected by both international and domestic law. Some of the women weren't themselves political, but they happened to be useful to officers by giving them a cover to gain entry into or maintain ties with political groups with whom those women had friendships. To the extent that there was any legitimate policing interests at all in the groups, and this is something which is seriously contested, it is out of all proportion to the devastation inflicted by the infiltration of their bodies, their emotional lives, their families and their homes. These relationships amounted to the most serious violations of the women's human rights, including their right to privacy, to freedom of expression, to freedom of association, and most significantly, their right to dignity, their absolute right not to be subjected to inhuman and degrading treatment. No matter what accusations were being levelled at either the groups the officers were targeting or even the women themselves. There was 
and could be no lawful excuse for such seriously abusive relationships. This is not a vexed issue, as the officers represented by Slater and Gordon seek to suggest. There is nothing difficult about balancing the rights of women against the interests of the state in policing environmental, political and social justice movements. As the Metropolitan Police has long recognised, ever since it settled the cases brought by some of the women, these deceitful relationships were not justified and can never be justified. And it is grossly offensive and insulting for the officers represented by Slater and Gordon to attempt to perpetuate the lie that any of these women consented to the abuse that was perpetrated on them. These relationships were driven by institutional sexism, an expression of the deeply sexist attitudes pervading the police in general and the undercover units in particular. Such attitudes founded on a lack of respect for women's autonomy resulted in the use of the women as mere objects, as props to shore up the fake identities of the officers, something which even now, as noted, disgustingly, the officers represented by Slater and Gordon continue to think is okay. The proportion of women used as objects in this way hugely outnumbered the men, and women were inevitably at risk of suffering so much more than men. Only women could fall pregnant and give birth to the child of an officer. Only women could lose their childbearing years to the manipulation of the state. And that sexism is also displayed by the assumption that it was acceptable to hide the relationships from the wives of the officers with no consideration given to the impact on them of that deception and the harm caused to their families. We now know that married officers were deliberately select, selected for undercover work in the SDS because it was, thought that, it was thought that this would make them more likely to transition back to their former life at the end of the de deployment. So reducing the risk, for example, that they might go rogue and defect and join the groups that they were spying on. As you've heard so powerfully from the wives, they were also seen and treated as objects to be used to suit the purposes of these units, rather than people with rights that needed to be respected. Before I turn to address the common themes, I want to introduce the women I represent, and I want to tell you about the undercover officers who deceived them, when and over what time. Lizzie met Mike Chitty, who she knew as Mike Blake in 1984, when she was involved in SLAM, that's the South London Animal Rights Movement. They started an intimate and committed relationship in 1985, and they were together for about a year and a half, when he suddenly said he was moving to Florida. He then disappeared from her life, not responding to her letters, until suddenly in 1989, he reappeared and tried repeatedly to resume the relationship, but Lizzie had lost trust. Belinda Harvey is one of those women who wasn't involved in any social or political movements, but she knew people who were. And in 1987, she was deceived into an intimate and intense relationship with Bob Lambert, a man she knew as Bob Robinson. This lasted for almost two years. And during that time, Lambert moved into her house. He disappeared from her life in December, 1988. At one point, Lambert told Belinda about his intent to plant incendiary devices in Debenhams, which she attempted to persuade, dissuade him from doing. In 1990, Helen Steele was deceived into a relationship with John Dines, who was posing as fellow protester John Barker, and they got to know each other through their involvement in London Greenpeace. And as you'll hear from Helen later, London Greenpeace is not the Greenpeace we all know. It was a small environmental movement operating in London. Helen was 24 at the time. The relationship became deeply committed and the couple moved in together and they discussed a future life, a life with children. But after about two years, John suddenly disappeared from Helen's life. And as we'll hear later, Helen spent 18 years searching for him and trying to find out the truth. 
Between 1991 and 1994, Denise Fuller had an intimate relationship with a man she knew as Matt Rayner. Rayner was in fact an undercover officer. Bayer had an intimate relationship with Anthony Lewis, who she knew as Bobby. Anthony Lewis was his cover name and Bobby was his nickname, how he was known. This relationship went on between 1992 and 1993 after she'd met him at a, social, social, at a meeting of the Socialist Workers' Party in Dalston in London. At the time, Bayer was a single parent. She had two young children and she'd just escaped from an abusive relationship. So she was extremely vulnerable at the time. Like Bayer, Jenny also met Bobby through her involvement. She was also involved in the SWP uh, and in addition in the Anti-Nazi League. She met Bobby in 1992 and 1993 and they became very good friends. And in 2005, Bobby told her that he was leaving for Spain and they spent an emotional last evening together when they went at the end of which they went to bed. She discovered in 2019 that he had been an undercover officer when she saw a photograph of him on her friend's Facebook feed. Jessica was only 19 years old in 1992 when she was deceived into a relationship with Andy Davey. That relationship continued for more than a year. They met in the course of their involvement in London Boots animal action demonstrations. Andy told her he was 24. In fact, Andy Davey is really Andy Coles and he was 32 years old and married at the time. When Jessica discovered the truth about him in 2017, Coles was the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for Cambridgeshire. He was also a Conservative Party councillor for Peterborough Council, something which he remains to date. In 1995, Alison was a teacher. She began a relationship with Mark Cassidy who she had met through her involvement in the Colin Roach Centre. The relationship was extremely close and intense over a five year period. For most of that time, they lived together. Like Helen Steele, Alison spent many years searching for the truth after Cassidy, really Mark Jenner, a married undercover officer with two children, suddenly disappeared. Monica met Jim Sutton, real name Jim Boiling, in 1996 through her involvement in Reclaim the Streets. They began an intimate relationship in April of 1997. It lasted for about six months, but after it ended, they remained good friends for a couple of years. Ruth was also involved in Reclaim the Streets and she met Jim Sutton real name Jim Boiling, when he was in a relationship with Monica. And after that relationship had broken down in late 1997, she began to see Sutton. This was her first really serious relationship and it lasted for almost two years. Rosa was also active in Re Reclaim the Streets. And I'm going to come on to her relationship in detail later. But next I'm going to tell you about three of my clients together, Wendy, Sarah and Ellie. In about 1997, Wendy, who was involved in the animal rights movement, met a fellow Hunt Sabba named James Straven. Over the following years, Straven became one of her closest friends. She put in a good word for him when in late 1998, he expressed an interest in Sarah, who had recently joined the Hunt Sab group. And that good word, uh, seems to have borne fruit because Sarah and James then had an intimate relationship for about two years, which ended as a result of James' claim that he had difficulties in maintaining intimate relationships for long periods because of a traumatic set of childhood experiences. Despite such protestations, however, shortly afterwards, he began a relationship with Ellie, who he had met through Wendy. Ellie was only 21. The relationship ended almost a year later when James said he was moving abroad. Wendy and Ellie continued to stay in touch with James, both but by email 
uh, and, and other messaging, and they met every couple of years. In April of 2018, James called Ellie, telling her that he'd been an undercover officer. He told her to delete their WhatsApp messages and their emails. It's absolutely clear that he was trying to destroy the evidence that was going to reveal the lies that he had already told the inquiry, because James had twice lied to the inquiry. First, he denied that he had any intimate relationship, including with Sarah and Ellie. And second, that the only details he could provide in order that the contact could be made with them was a guess at an old email address. Between 2002 and 2004, Donna McLean had an intimate relationship with Carlo Neri, who she'd met at an anti-war demonstration. They lived together and he proposed marriage. At the time of this relationship, he was already married and he had a small child. And he had a second child shortly after his relationship with Donna ended. The following five women were all deceived by Mark Kennedy, whose cover name was Mark Stone. And they all met him in the course of their activism in environmental and social justice movements. Kate Wilson met Kennedy in Nottingham in late 2003 at a meeting of the Nottingham Network for Social Environmental Activists. They quickly became intimate and very closely involved in each other's lives. By 2005, their relationship had become largely platonic, but they remained very, very close. And he remained her point, her main point of contact in the UK in the following years when she moved abroad. Lisa met Kennedy through her involvement in environmental and social justice activism. And she began a relationship with Kennedy in late 2004. They went on to have an, an intimate, committed relationship that lasted for six years. He was close to her family. He attended her father's funeral. The relationship ended in October 2010 when Lisa and others, together with, who gave her help, uncovered Kennedy's true identity. Naomi was also involved in environmental and social justice campaigning. And she met Kennedy in 2003, and she began a relationship with him in 2005. It lasted for about six months. And they too remained close friends over the ensuing years. And they had two more sexual encounters. C, also a long-term environmental activist, met Kennedy in 2009 at the Earth First gathering in Cumbria, and they became friends. In early 2010, he contacted C and he went out of his way to establish a connection with her. They began an intimate relationship in March of 2010, and it's understood that around this time, Kennedy had actually left the Metropolitan Police Force and was now working for a private security firm. Jane was a very close friend of Kennedy's for seven years, that is throughout the entire period of his deployment as an undercover officer. She was the first person he met on the activist scene when he arrived in Nottingham. They had a few intimate encounter encounters in late 2008, and thereafter they remained close friends until his true identity was revealed in October 2010. Maya, whilst living in a housing cooperative in Lewisham, met the undercover officer Rob Harrison, that's his cover name. She met him through neighbours who were activists involved in anti-imperialism and Palestinian solidarity. She began a relationship with him in May 2006. It lasted for almost a year when he suddenly claimed that his mother was dying of cancer and he needed to spend her final months with her. After he left, he communicated intermittently. And then in August of 2014, he contacted her again and on his invitation they met up. Over the next few months he expressed a desire to resume the relationship and to have children together and as a result of this fresh contact Maya broke up with the partner she had been in a relationship with for the previous five years and who she was also living with at the time. In February of 2015 Maya and Rob slept together 
for the first time since they've been separated in 2007, seven, and they had unprotected sex. And Maya then had to take emergency contraception the following day. The same day, Rob disappeared, and with the exception of one email sent to her in 2016, he has never contacted Maya since. In March 2017, 2019, I'm sorry, Maya learned that Rob Harrison was an undercover officer. I'm now going to tell you in detail about Rosa to give you a deeper sense, as I said, of what the women have been through. And also in response to the opening statement on behalf of the officers represented by Slater and Gordon, in which a point was made that one of the women continued their relationship once they had found out that the man that they'd been involved in was an undercover officer. They were referring to Rosa. Rosa is a politics graduate with a master's in political theory. She's always felt a strong obligation to stand up to injustice. She joined anti-apartheid in her teenage years and she's been active in campaigns around animal rights, environmental, anti-racist and social justice issues ever since then. Her political activism is central to who she is. When I say ever since then, I should preface that. She was until Jim Boiling came into her life. Like Monica and Ruth, Rosa met Jim Boiling through Reclaim the Streets. And shortly after his relationship with Ruth ended, in November 1999, he started an intense, intimate relationship with Rosa. Initially, Rosa tried to end it because she wasn't com comfortable with the extent of the intensity. But he dissuaded her, claiming that he felt relieved to hear that he too had the same fears, that everything would be fine. And he felt as if it was, the, it, it was as if they were soulmates. And within a very short period of time, Rosa thought too that she had met her soulmate. She now understands that this was the result of his training in mirroring. And we're gonna hear more about this later. She also now believes that Jason Bishop, another undercover officer, passed on information to Jim that she'd shared with him prior to meeting Jim and that Jim used in an attempt to increase their emotional connection. And as a res result of that seemingly significant connection and her relationship with him, Rosa changed her plans and she rejected an offer of a quarterly guest editorial ship in the green European youth magazine, Green Pepper. She felt it was too soon to be in a different country to him. In February 2000, at Jim's suggestion, she moved in with him and their relationship appeared to blossom. Their time between their political commitments was spent as a couple, sensuously cooking together, playing in the park and each seeming to grow as a person in light, as a person in light of, of learning from each other. One day in May, out of the blue, Jim came home and told Rosa that he needed to sort his head out and that he planned to go traveling alone that September. Despite being deeply hurt, Rosa accepted that and, and she accepted it was right for him to do this. Nevertheless, at his instigation, they discussed their future together, children and areas in which they'd settle on his return. They left a week early for the Earth First gathering in Snowdonia in June 2000, again at his suggestion, to travel through the country of her family's heritage, to check out areas that they might move to. However, as time passed, Jim's behaviour became erratic. On occasion, he'd hug Rosa tightly, saying, I never want to lose you. And then on other occasions, he'd behave in a bizarre and sometimes abusive manner towards her. He then disclosed that he'd been adopted and that as a consequence, he'd had a disturbing childhood. When September came, John told Rosa he was going to travel to Turkey. And, on, and from there, he planned to hitchhike to South Africa. He said he needed to sort things out. He needed to do this on his own before they continued living together. Rosa found his push and pull so hard that an old university friend offered her to stay in Cyprus with their family over the period that he was leaving. She eventually called him just before he left and he was agitated. He had a heightened sense of security, suggesting that she shouldn't have called him 
and she shouldn't have used somebody else's phone. He said he'd call her from Turkey when she was home in London, and he later did. He was distressed, he was unstable, he was in tears, but claiming that he was so heartened by their conversation and the fact she still loved him and that he would send a happier postcard that day. And he asked if he could call her in a couple of days. He stated he was about to hitchhike to Syria. However, after that, she didn't hear from him and she became extremely worried for his safety. She started to suffer from anxiety, from depression. She had panic attacks and she sought counseling. She contacted the foreign office to express concern about his safety. And they informed her that they had no record of his leaving Istanbul. And they told her that the Turkish authorities would be in control of investigating his disappearance as he was considered to be a missing British national. She tried to make contact with his family, but she couldn't locate them. She tried to find him by other means, including looking for his birth certificate for clues, but she couldn't find any trace of him. And at this point, she called back to the foreign office and she said that he'd been located, he was safe and well, because she was terrified that he could be on the run from the state and that she'd just told an arm of the state where he was headed. As part of her searches, she obtained his phone bills and she made phone calls to numbers which weren't identifiable by, the closest, by close associates in their political circles. And unbeknownst to her, these numbers were for police officers, one of whom was Jim's handler. One of the calls was answered by somebody who sounded panicked and he demanded to know where she got the number. And that was, as we, as we now know, a number from somebody in, in, in the SDS headquarters. The other call was answered by somebody who denied knowing Jim, but then took a very lengthy message because he said he might later realise that he did know him. Rosa then received a letter from Jim from Kenya, and that was followed by a postcard in which he said that he would set up a new email address for himself. He subsequently sent a series of emails over the course of 2000 and 2001 from this address. They stated he was still in love with her, that he'd been forced to leave her against his wishes, that he wasn't acting freely and that he wasn't coping well, and that he hoped they'd meet again. He advised her not to discuss issues on the phone, not to tell anyone of their contact, explaining that otherwise it would make it difficult for him to contact her again. She grilled him in her responses about what was going on, but she only received riddles back and no explanations. And eventually she cut contact with him because the strain was affecting her physical health. But she carried on searching, spending days at a time in the British Library, searching through electoral records, tracking on foot areas he'd taken her to, phoning public and private bodies who held information, such as councils, undertaking similar searches for anyone he'd mentioned. She trawled the family record centre for months, but found no one who could be him. He'd seemingly never been born. Through this period, Rosa had dropped out of her movement, no longer trusting that she could know who anyone really was. She tried to fill her waking hours not spent searching with intense activity to manage her psychological symptoms. As I said, she received counselling. And when her counsellor gave her hope that Jim was a good person in trauma, she began emailing him again. And he answered within half an hour something he claimed was somehow mystical. He was full of mixed messages, of having moved on, but being unable ever to move on. This was July 2001, and Rosa was so worried about Jim that she travelled to South Africa, where G Jim's emails had stated that he was. One line of investigation suggested that he'd become caught up in international drug smuggling, she also needed answers as to what had just happened in her life, if she was ever going to have closure. He emailed her saying, please go home, Rosa. You're not going to find me in South Africa. You'll be closer to me in London. But she didn't believe him, as he seemed to be on the run from something. So she kept searching in South Africa, numb due to the trauma, to the risks that she was actually taking with her own safety. She received further emails from Jim including one saying that he needed her to keep writing to him. I need to know you are there, even if I can't touch you. 
Rosa now believes that Jim and his superiors wanted her to keep emailing so that they could keep track of her movements. She then found out through a contact that she'd recently made in South Africa that Jim was accessing his emails in England. So she immediately returned to the UK. And on her return, she was unable to cope with even simple things like names of underground stations, signs. She was so traumatized and she was suffering from paranoia to the extent that she feared for her life due to the perception that an unknown entity was trying to track her while she tracked him. In her hypervigilant state, she was out of contact with everyone in her life. She was sleeping on strangers' floors and scanning for CCTV cameras everywhere she went. She continued to try to find him financed by the last of her savings. And eventually she managed to discover that Jim's real name is Jim Boiling. She identified the school that he'd gone to and she obtained details of his true relatives. By this time, in November 2001, she had lost so much weight that she weighed less than seven stone. She was scared to make contact with anyone she knew. She researched the telephone numbers that she called from Jim's mobile phone and was informed that they were blocked, blocked government numbers with attached security triggers. She nonetheless managed to find the details of an address associated with one of the numbers. And on 3rd November 2001, she went to the address. It was a small warehouse in Camberwell with opaque barred windows. She sat outside recording the number plates of the vehicles which appeared to be associated with the premises. She didn't know this at the time, but she had managed to find the premises out of which the SDS operated. She did, however, work out that the building was part of some kind of state surveillance. She didn't know if Jim was running from them or being obliged to stay within their organization, but she felt that this information alone placed her at risk. Two days later, on the 5th of November of 2001, Rosa started working in a bookstore. And on that very same day, Jim walked in. It's clear to Rosa, she'd come too close to finding out about the SDF, SDS and uncovering the truth and that Jim was sent to stop her. When they met later that evening, he disclosed to her that he had, in fact, been an undercover police officer, and he told her his real name. He said, however, that, I'm sorry, sir, I'm going to stop one second because I've just realised that my, uh, my um, power is not plugged in, so I'm just going to correct that. Yeah, it's plugged in now. You can tend to continue. Sorry. So he, uh, yes, so he told her his real name, but he said, however, that he had, from the moment he had infiltrated the groups, come to share their values. He told Rosa he was very much in love with her and that he wanted to continue their relationships. He claimed he tried to protect his fellow activists, hiding information from the police, undertaking actions that they didn't know about because it was what he stood for. He insisted he was the only person placed in the movement and that he'd been placed in it for a political investigation, insisting the movement was safe, but that he lived in fear of his work finding out of who he really was inside politically and that they'd destroy him if they found out. He said he was being forced to live a false life forever in their shadow and was desperate to escape, but he couldn't do it alone. He initially mocked her for thinking that the state spied on peaceful green organizations. And then he switched to loving compassion for the effect of the trauma on her perception. Rosa had been destabilized and utterly isolated by over a year of searching and by her extreme fear that she chanced on some kind of malevolent secret state organization. She believed that Jim was telling, telling her the truth and she agreed to help him escape and start a new life. She moved in with him pending their departure. At this point, it was just her and her rucksack. 
Within two weeks, she was pregnant. Jim insisted that Rosa destroy all records of her activist past, claiming that they were at risk, at risk of being aggressively raided by the police at any time because of their relationship and them seeming, seeing that he had betrayed them. He oversaw the disposal, disposal of all pages of her address book, which contained contact details for all her activist friends. And in January 2002, he pressured her to change her name by deed poll, saying that otherwise it wouldn't be safe for her to seek medical help with her pregnancy. This erasure of Rosa, we now know, was another attempt to isolate her, preventing anyone from finding her. Their first child, a daughter, was born in August of 2002. Despite continuing promises to leave the police, Jim continued working for the Metropolitan Police Service, eventually not undercover, but in the Muslim contact unit where he worked alongside Bob Lambert. So for two occasions in about 2002 and 2003, when they attended Kingston Green Fair, Jim insisted that Rosa should have no contact with any former friends or acquaintances. On the first occasion, Jim had made them suddenly hide behind a tent because he'd just seen another undercover officer. This was Jason Bishop. Where previously he claimed there were no undercover officers in the movement apart from him. This was the beginning of Jim describing their old world as pitted with undercover officers and private informants, wanting, warning Rosa that she could not know who anyone was and that she would be picked up by his works radar before she got to speak to anyone. She was desperate to be part of the old community, community with whom she shared her core beliefs. She was also desperate to get a message to Helen Steele, especially so once Jim told her that Helen's former partner, who they'd both known as John Barker, had also been an undercover officer. When Boiling had suddenly left in 2000 and Rosa had started that desperate surge, Helen had spoken to Rosa about John Barker because, as I mentioned, like Rosa, Helen had carried out her own searches and those searches had led her to question who this man that she had loved so much really was. So Rosa knew and understood Helen's plight and she wanted to tell her. While at that Kingston fair, Rosa was unable to spot anyone who could safely pass that message on to Helen. Jim told Rosa that she wouldn't be able to contact Helen without his work knowing about it. He said that Helen's movements were being monitored and he gave details of the contents of Helen's luggage that she, he said she didn't know had even been searched. He referred to conversations picked up from phone taps on another friend so Rosa was stuck. She just couldn't reach out. In 2004, her son was born. Over time, Jim's behaviour had become increasingly controlling, erratic and abusive. Rosa wanted to leave him. Indeed, she tried on a few occasions, but she was trapped because she believed he'd be able to track her down and use his status and connections as an undercover police officer. She telephoned Women's Aid for advice, but they confirmed her fears that because he was a police officer in an undercover unit, they couldn't guarantee that he wouldn't be able to trace her um, when they changed her name and relocated her. Despite her increasing concern, Jim convinced her to sign documentation at a registry office to marry him. He claimed a lack of commitment on her part was stopping him from turning his back on the police from becoming Jim Sutton, his real self. She didn't find this credible, but she agreed to the marriage because if she was wrong, all would be resolved. But if she was right, her guilt for pulling the children from their home, if she ran from boiling, would be diminished. After the marriage, the relationship became even more abusive. Rosa moved into a caravan in Wales with the children in an effort to make Jim keep his promise to finally leave the police and she took her birth name back against his wishes. In December of 2006, 
Jim's daughter, Jim and Rosa's daughter, was diagnosed with a rare, life-limiting degenerative disorder, which has a very poor prognosis. In January 2007, Rosa learned that their son also suffers from the same disorder. Following this news, Bob Lambert, who was at the time Jim's manager, and long spoken of by Jim for his role in the SDS, made what Jim described as a welfare visit to their home. Together with another colleague from the SDS, this was a man she knew as Noel. Rosa had already learned from Jim that Noel was actually the man who had taken the message from her when she tried finding him back in 2001. On the occasion of Bob Lambert and Noel's visit, Noel told Rosa to contact him if she had any concerns about Jim's behaviour. But when she actually did so subsequently, the conversation turned sinister. He made it clear to her that should she ever speak out, it wouldn't only be Jim's word against hers, but the weight of special branch also. She now believes that the invitation to call was to set up an early warning system as part of their attempt to contain her. Over the following months, Jim's behaviour deteriorated even further. And in February of 2007, Rosa fled with her children to a refuge. But the process of leaving him was protracted and difficult and it wasn't until January 2008 that he agreed to a separation and commenced divorce proceedings. Through this period, he applied all his training, all his experience in deceit and manipulation to manipulate social services on whom Rosa depended and her children, as did her children on account of their diagnosis. In July, 2010, Rosa took a risk to confide in someone who had been in her movement. She'd long considered this person to be a police plant and Boiling had even pointed them out to her when they were moving the family to live in a neighboring district. However, on this occasion, the person claimed to have seen Boiling somewhere. Boiling had led Rosa to believe he couldn't go. And this made her fear that he, Boiling may have returned to spying and was using his previous connection to the family to lend him credibility. Having confided in this person, she wrote a letter and asked for it to be passed to Helen Steele. And this person did pass the letter on. And so word finally reached the environmental movement and the wider world that Jim had been a spy. Rosa met Helen later in the autumn and made further disclosures and I'll come on to those later. Rosa spent the intervening years involved in several cases and campaigns alongside the other women. And I again will detail these later on. And that included also making an official police complaint against Boiling himself. Jim remained a police officer with the Metropolitan Police until he was finally sacked in 2018 following disciplinary proceedings instituted as a result of Rosa's complaint, in which he was found guilty of gross misconduct because of his relationship with Rosa. She provided evidence to that hearing, and in the course of it, she was allowed to review a highly redacted, but nonetheless shocking bundle of documents containing boiling other SDS officers and managers witness statements. As part of the announcement of their finding, the disciplinary panel read the contents of two files that Boiling had submitted about her to his SDS supervisors. He'd submitted the first just before he moved, into her, uh, she, he moved her into his flat, and he referred to her as a significant organizer of an event he was targeting. And in the second, which was submitted in the heyday of their relationship, he referred to her also as a political organizer. The tribunal panel noted that these files were inconsistent with his evidence in which he had stated that Rosa was an apolitical waitress who was not a target of his investigation. As you can imagine, the experience of the misconduct proceedings was deeply traumatising. The impact of these decades of events on Rosa has been too profound 
to properly be able to put into words. She's suffered from very significant psychiatric injury and her ability to engage in political activity as stated previously a central part of her identity has been irreparably damaged. She's unable to develop social or intimate relationships. She grieves for the loss of the person she was before she met Jim. She feels disconnected from the joy of life as a result of the need to numb her emotions, to dampen the trauma and to make sure she's strong enough for her children. Her two children born of the state operations require 24 hour care on a more than one to one basis. So they require living carers in addition to the full time support that she provides. She feels a strong sense of injustice for the lack of acknowledgement of the harm done to all of her children's lives. For her older two, who had they been well, would have faced a lifetime of unimaginable identity issues. As it is, having a degenerative condition, their prime years were lost to isolation and abuse, robbed of all that there was their mothers to share with them, politically, socially, culturally. And since then, they are left in a precarious care situation with only one family manager, ma ma family member to manage their high needs, with the consequential loss of opportunities and integration in the time they have left. For her younger son, born of a donor, as another relationship could not have been possible again, for the sense she lives with of threat and injustice from the state, for carrying the consequence of the police spying operations, including tending to and taking responsibility for her siblings. Her opportunities are profoundly affected and she lives with the multiple effects and the toll it's taken on her mother. Rosa wonders to what extent the inquiry has begun to grasp the depth and the vast nature of the ramifications of the state operations. This is the truth about the relationship that the Slater and Gordon officers spoke of as being renewed after the truth of the status of the officer was disclosed, disclosed. A decade of further deceit and abuse ending in escape to a women's refuge. I'm now going to speak about how the undercover policing scandal came to light because like much else I will touch upon, it demonstrates the indispensable role that those spied upon must play if the inquiry is going to get to the truth. I do so also because it is notable that this has been completely glossed over so far. No mention was made by counsel to the inquiry of the central role played by the women in bringing to light the undercover policing scandal. That role doesn't even appear in the chronology. And Peter Francis suggested that were it not for him, this inquiry would not have taken place. While he certainly played a significant role, he too downplays the vital role of the women. This is a further display of sexism, of women being portrayed only as victims, rescued by men, rather than as key players whose incredible work has been absolutely central in bringing the limited truth we now know into the open and whose testimony is going to be pivotal for this inquiry to, inquiry to understand what really went on. The public first became aware of this scandal when the story broke about Mark Kennedy in the media in January 2011 and it was presented initially as an extraordinary tale of a rogue agent somebody who'd been inadequately supervised in his role as an undercover police officer, responsible for a policing environmental protest, and which had therefore enabled him to have sexual relationships with a number of women. His cover was blown, as I've said, by Lisa, who had been in a serious committed relationship with him for six years. In the summer of 2010, she discovered his passport in his real name, which included reference to a child Initially, the false explanations that he gave her convinced her, but doubts began to creep in because there were inconsistencies in his story. 
And these increased when she heard from other protesters that Jim Sutton was an undercover police officer. And doubts were then also raised about another campaigner, Lynn Watson. Thirdly, about Rod Richardson. These doubts grew and eventually in October 2010, Lisa decided to investigate with fellow activists and friends and they started to research who Mark Kennedy really was and it was as a result of Lisa's searches that his cover was blown. They presented him with unanswerable evidence and he admitted the truth. Lisa came to learn about Jim Sutton because Rosa had managed to get the message out to Helen in the summer of 2010 that Jim had been an undercover officer and Helen had then told fellow campaigners who in turn had passed that information to others, eventually reaching Lisa. I mentioned that Helen visited Rosa in the autumn of 2010 and at that stage Rosa explained in more detail that John Barker was also an undercover officer, that Bob Lambert was an undercover officer and that Jason Bishop had also been a spy. I mentioned before that after John Barker disappeared, Helen had spent 18 years searching for him. Like Rosa, she demonstrated such a degree of persistence and skill, relying entirely on her own resources. She, she, she traveled across the world to New Zealand in search for the truth. And while she was unsuccessful in that she didn't managed to find John Down Dines there, and I should say in parenthesis, she has since found him and confronted him. She did uncover information which brought her very close to the truth and which led her to believe that he had been a police officer. But when she spoke to others about this, they all told her that she was being completely paranoid and that such a thing could never ever happen in this country. So this left Helen for 18 years in a state of appalling uncertainty and mistrust. Mistrust in her instincts and a fundamental mistrust in others. So to finally learn the truth after 18 years was both utterly devastating, but also a spur for something to be done. So she began to bring the women together. Those women who it was now possible to identify as having been in relationships with the police spies whose identities were now, now known. And she suggested that they should try to take wider action to expose what was going on, that they should seek redress and they should do what they can to prevent this to from ever happening again. And these women included Rosa, Lisa, Belinda and Alison. I mentioned Alison earlier as somebody who had also undertaken extensive researches for her ex-boyfriend. That was Mark Cassidy. And she too had come close to finding out the truth. She talked about Mark Cassidy's disappearance with Helen back in 2003. So even though Mark Cassidy's name had not been associated with being an undercover officer, it was clear he was as well. And we finally learned the truth about that. He is Mark Jenner. By the end of 2011, eight women had begun legal proceedings against the Metropolitan Police Service in respect of those intimate relationships that they'd been deceived into having. Other cases were also brought by other women and Heather Williams uh, represented some of those. Since then, further women have, been, have come forward, as I've mentioned, including those who's uh, who've learned about the truth through the inquiry. And the accumulation of cases raises the pressing question. Are these really all instances of individual officers acting beyond their authority? Or is the pursuit of intimate relationships with women a deliberate tactic? The women strongly believe there are too many similarities between their cases and too many instances of undercover officers having relationships for the Metropolitan Police to maintain the position that it has adopted to date that these relationships 
resulted from a lack of supervision, they weren't known about, they weren't acquiesced in by more senior officers. Through speaking to one another and sharing their experiences, the women have been able to identify recognizable techniques and traits. I've touched on some of those, I'm gonna come into them uh, in more detail later. Those techniques and traits continue to resurface. And this is one of the reasons why it is so critical that the inquiry should draw on their knowledge and expertise. And indeed, on the knowledge and expertise of all the non-state, uh, non-police core participants to aid with its investigation, not to seek to compartmentalize their participation into temporary, temporarily restricted categories as it is doing at present. It is by painstakingly piecing together the many fragments of their experiences that these important patterns and themes emerge. The women know how they've been shaped by their experiences and how, as a result, they are able to recognize things in each other's accounts that wouldn't occur to those who haven't experienced anything similar. Getting to the truth is also critically important to enable them to move on with their lives. And this necessarily includes understanding the wider systemic issues of how these secret units developed and evolved from the start. How the attitude towards sexual relationships and using women came about. How knowledge and techniques were shared. Who knew about the sexual relationships? Who within the police sanctioned such behavior over so many years? Whether they were condoned or encouraged? If not, why they weren't stopped, given the frequency with which they were occurring. Why weren't they stopped? The history of surveillance of the women while they were searching for missing partners, the development of containment exercises when they were deemed to have found out too much. And finally, the women need to know as part of a community of women affected in this way, that all those affected have been found and have support and that robust legal measures are in place to ensure that these abuses cannot be repeated in the future. In due course, the inquiry is likely to see psychiatric and psycholo psychological evidence in respect of the harm that undercover policing and the relationships in particular have done to the women. Time and again, these reports refer to the importance of learning the truth in order to be able to heal. The inquiry was, at least in part, set up for the purposes of establishing justice for the families and victims. And it should have, at the forefront of its priorities, not only ensuring that its process doesn't exacerbate the harm done to the women, but it gives them the answers they need to heal. The strength of that need to know is illustrated by the efforts of Kate Wilson in her pursuit of proceedings in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, something I'm going to come to again in some detail later. She's pursued those efforts, notwithstanding the fact that the Metropolitan Police has settled her common law claims arising from the relationships that she had with Mark Kennedy. And the other women who brought claims against Kennedy were precluded by the terms of those settlements from pursuing those claims in the IPT. And for those who had relationships with Kennedy uh, before 2000, there was no means by which they could pursue such claims in the IPT. So Kate exemplifies that need for the truth that resides in all the women. And in a witness statement that she made in the IPT proceedings, she said this, I have no criminal convictions, even for minor offences, and the only reason these officers entered my life at all was because I was expressing my political views and exercising my right to protest. I still don't know, after six years of litigation in the High Court, whether Mark Kennedy defied his gui guidelines and supervisors and began to share his life with me in a dangerous web of lies he told me, but also his handlers. The alternative is a much harder reality, that my sexual violation and emotional manipulation, manipulation were not simply a negligent oversight by the managers and supervisors, 
they were considered tactical decisions in the police's highly questionable battle against a thousand or more political group groups in this country and abroad. I still don't know what the true story is, but over the last six years, new information and new perspectives have emerged that have forced me to accept that is probably the latter narrative that is closer to the truth. Since then, some initial disclosure has been made to Miss Wilson in the IPT proceedings, which has led her to make a further statement, included in which she says the following. I am acutely aware that the information I have been given is a drop in the ocean, the result of a conscious selection by the MPS of what they have chosen to reveal, and that there is very much I still do not know. Nevertheless, even that tiny and over-redacted example has answered more of my burning questions than seven years of police defence statements and admissions. Not only is it now obvious that the actions of other officers are central to my claim following this disclosure, it is also clear that the defendant's characterization of the central claim in this matter as being the sexual relationship carried on by Mark Kennedy and the failure to su properly supervise him such that the relationships took place is inaccurate. It wasn't simply a lack of supervision. There was active collusion by management in the relationship and direct manipulation of my political activity. In other words, even the minimal selective and highly redacted disclosure so far made by Ms. to Ms. Wilson in the IPT proceedings has enabled her to shed critical light on the way in which the MPS has sought to characterize the context of her relationship with Mark Kennedy. The admissions in her claim in the IPT don't only relate to the actions of Mark Kennedy, but also to six other undercover officers and Mark's principal cover officer. The tribunal has made it clear that the state of knowledge of other more senior officers about the breaches of her Article 3 rights, that's her right not to be subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment, whilst now admitted, will be a key matter to be determined at the substantive hearings of the claim. Now, this ought to highlight for the inquiry the value of those who's lived ex with lived experience um, of undercover policing, the value that they can bring to the inquiry's search for the truth. It will also to highlight, as one of the women has described, that the truth in relation to undercover policing is, is like an onion, that there are layers and layers to peel away. And in order to get behind the superficial, the partial truths, the inquiry needs the assistance of those who are able to critique the police documents based on their own lived experience. It will ultimately be for the inquiry to de determine where the truth lies, but it won't be able to fulfill its task if it doesn't open those police documents and the evidence up to scrutiny by others who were also there at the time. I want now to turn to the impact the relationships on the women. The way in which the Slater and Gordon officers spoke of these relationships in their opening is, as I've already said, frankly obscene. In their statement, the officers failed completely to acknowledge or recognize the enormity of the, the abuse they perpetrated, the profound feelings of love, of trust that the officers engendered by their manipulation, by their deceit, and the terrible, terrible damage that this has wrought on the lives of fellow human beings as a result. On top of this, they likened their spying activities to those of an MI5 officer infiltrating a ter terrorist group. These were social and environmental campaigners, not terrorists. But even if they had been, the use of intimate relationships as a tactic has never been prescribed by law, is inherently sexist and degrading and inhumane, uh, inhuman. And as such, it is treatment that cannot be justified in any circumstances. But simply, 
the impact has been devastating and life altering. The vast majority have been diagnosed with very significant psychiatric injuries, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Before they even discovered the truth, many of the women were already deeply traumatized and scarred by the deceptions and the extreme emotional ma manipulation that was practiced on them. To groom the women, the officers mirrored their interests and their values. They were unstintingly supportive and attentive. So unsurprisingly, many of the women fell deeply, deeply in love. They believed, as Rosa did, that they'd met their soulmates. And then, having drawn the women in so comprehensively, they then deployed a markedly similar and deeply cruel exit strategy. It was a sudden withdrawal and it was often accompanied by an apparent mental breakdown or emotional trauma. And in this way, they would just disappear out of the lives of the women. This left them not only dealing with their own sudden, inexplicable and enormous loss, but also carrying a huge burden of worry and fear about the welfare of their lost partner. Having lost someone that they loved because they were so seemingly perfect, that inevitably bore on the women's ability to forge later relationships. And in some cases, the resulting difficulties were compounded because the officers continued to make sporadic contact. Contemporary understanding of the traumatic effect of an impact of betrayal has increasingly recognized the significance of the shattering of the victim's assumptions. In particular, three very basic assumptions we carry about the world. That the world is benevolent, that the world is meaningful, and that the self is worthy. Here, in their own words, some of the women describe the devastating consequences of that shattering of their basic assumptions. My partner, this is Lisa, turned out to be leading a double life and was not in fact the person I believed him to be at all, but the opposite in many ways. And he was placed into my life to deceive me by an employer who would inevitably one day pull him out. Finding this out has broken my heart, devastated my life and shattered my trust in people. It's also impacted on my confidence in myself as a person worthy of such a relationship and in my ability to judge character. The fact that this disregard for my mental health was sanctioned by the state is a fact that I am still struggling to process. As the most unbelievable thing in the world turned out to be true, I had no solid ground upon which to base my judgments of what was likely or unlikely. She said also, I feel really destabilized and sometimes I feel nauseous. I feel like everything's shifting, like I have motion sickness. And this is Naomi. The world recoiled and I could not get my bearings. I spent many months afterwards trying to re reconstruct all my memories to make sense of my experiences. In fact, I could not, and I have not managed to do this or to reconcile my direct personal knowledge of Mark Stone with everything I've learned about Mark Kennedy. And this is Sarah. The impact has evolved over time. The knowledge has annihilated the relationship. Um, I understand that, but it's taken time. It didn't happen immediately. The pain has become deeper and more distressing as the seriousness of the violation and the extent of the betrayal sinks in. I can only describe it as layers of an onion that keep peeling off the more that time passes and other things come back into my mind about the relationship. James, that this was sanctioned higher up in the police, the complete invasion of my privacy. Now I feel like, like my life is being invaded all over again and again and again. And this is Kate. In terms of explaining my reaction to the news, it's hideously hard to do. It's like I've lost all integrity and every feeling has an opposite that makes it null and void. 
I was furiously angry and at the same time, devastatingly sad. Sad at the loss of a loved one who was never a loved one, mourning the death of someone who never existed while cursing his very existence and so on in circles that it is impossible to find closure for any one feeling as it follows into another equally debilitating one. It is always there and it won't go away. Kate, again, this has left me with deep and traumatic gaps in my own biography. And Monica, when I received the news, it felt like a slow motion explosion. What I mean by that is the impact of this news keeps hitting me in different ways over a period of time, as though different pieces of the puzzle have fallen on the ground at different times and in different places. The institutional aspect is uniquely destabilizing. The fact that these were police officers with the power of the state behind them. When the state has put an imposter in the most intimate aspects of your life, there really is no solid ground left on which to stand. The reality is so outlandish that truly anything seems possible. Many of the women continue to struggle with feelings of being watched, bugged, trapped, monitored. Many of them describe incidents where they've been convinced that something apparently innocuous is in fact indicative of continued, to, continued monitoring by the state. For example, one of the women became convinced that email messages that were superficially spam were in fact coded messages from or about her former partner. Others have been convinced that objects have been moved within their home indicating that somebody's been inside. Nearly all of the women no longer feel able to participate in political activity because of the fear of being spied on. They've been stripped of the freedom to, ma to manifest their political beliefs with others, a freedom which for many was at the very core of their identities. The ability to campaign for a better world was what that gave them hope for the future and it's now gone. Relationships, both intimate and familial, have been damaged. Many of the women experience flashbulb memories, often around sex, making intimate relationships very difficult. For those women who had children fathered by undercover officers, the additional torment is immeasurable. The children are, of course, the focus of their overwhelming love and their protective instincts. Yet, at the same time, their circumstances are an indelible reminder of the cruel deception practiced on them. Recognition must be given to the harm done to the children born into and trapped in these state engineered relationships. There are children yet to receive any apology from the Metropolitan Police Service. For several women, the consequence of the deceit and the betrayal has been that their childbearing years have passed without them being able to form a relationship that would have enabled them to start a family. Many of the women have had significant and long lasting difficulties with subsequent relationships because genuine partners have been compared with the idealized relationship constructed by the undercover officer or, and, and sometimes and, because their ability to trust has been completely shattered. Some of the women who have been able to start a family feel that their relationships with their children have been damaged by the trauma that they suffered and the desperate need they had to continue to fight to uncover the truth, despite the glacial speed of the inquiry and its unpromising record to date. For many of the women, the intrusion extended well into their families for those like C and Bea, who already had a child in their lives, there was the obvious danger that the child would become attached to the officer and then suffer trauma when the relationship inevitably ended. Mark Jenner was, was embraced by Alison's family. He often spent fi Friday nights together with them, celebrating the Jewish Sabbath. Mark Kennedy was heavily integrated into both Lisa and Kate Wilson's families. And he also spent special occasions with Naomi's fa family. Jim Boiling even prevented Rosa from being by her father's bedside when he died. Bob Lambert 
went to visit Belinda's parents, her sister and her grandmother in her care home. Her family considered he was her life partner. All the car harm caused to wider family members, especially children, must be taken in fully into account as wholly, wholly unjustified collateral damage. Many of the women have had their careers blighted, either because of the psychiatric injuries they suffered or because they were in a profession which requires contact with police, for example, social work, which they now can't face, or because of the choices they were encouraged to make by the undercover officer when they were still in a relationship. Sarah, for example, had a very high powered career, which she loved, but she relinquished it with James' encouragement. Alison reflected the experience of almost all the women when describing her response in evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee. This was evidence she gave in 2013. I have, for the last 13 years, questioned my own judgment and it has impacted seriously on my ability to trust. And that has impacted on my current relationship and other subsequent relationships. It has also distorted my perceptions of love and my perceptions of sex. And it has had a massive impact on my political activity. Sir, I, I, I suspect you were able to hear in uh, the first half of my submissions, the terrible drilling that uh, was going on, unfortunately, uh, it's got much worse and it's now that sort of um, dentist's drill uh, multiplied many times. So I do apologize if uh, it leads you to feeling like gritting your teeth, um, which is exactly to me. I haven't done so so far. Uh, as it happens, there is a certain amount of drilling going on in my background, but I pressed the mute button as I am able to do and you are not. No, I'm afraid not. Um, I will continue and I just ho I hope it doesn't become too awful. Uh, I'm now going to move on to talk about common traits and evidence that there was, uh, this was all a tactic, there was a system in play whereby women were used uh, as uh, tools in the surveillance exercise. As I've already said, that the sheer number of officers who were engaged in relationships whilst deployed must alone call into question the repeated assertion of the MPS that these were the unilateral actions of rogue officers. But the evidence that the women have put together through talking to each other um, and sharing what has happened to them, some of which I did touch upon, for example, in relation to Rosa, fully in our submission undermines the assertion that these were individual rogue officers and points to, at the very least, tacit authorization, but uh, uh, we believe actually a general intelligence gathering tool. It's clear, for example, that many undercover officers knew about the intimate relationships their colleagues were engaged in. For example, uh, Mark Kennedy brought two friends, Vinnie and Ed, they were called. We presume they were undercover officers. He brought them into the home he shared with Jane. And he then tried to set Jane up and another housemate with Vinnie. A perk of the job, perhaps, or another example of using sex to gain entry into the activist scene. It also needs to be said that Vinnie and Ed knew about Mark's relationship with Kate. And I want to add this, the identity of Ed and Vinnie is a key matter for determination in the IPT proceedings. Marco Jacobs was also aware of Kennedy's relationship with Kate and both he and Lynn Watson were well aware of Kennedy's relationship with Lisa. And Jason Bishop was aware of Jim Boiling's relationship with Monica, with Ruth and with Rosa. Indeed, the relationships were rarely hidden. And given the level to which many of the public gatherings the couples attended were monitored by the SDS or the MPOIU, it stretches credulity to suggest that the intimate relationships weren't known about within at least within the unit. Yet, if these really were the actions of rogue officers, it's simply 
inexplicable, inexplicable that nothing was done to stop or discourage them. Even more compelling though, is the common methodology that the undercover officers deployed. The methods by which the women were groomed, the methods which dictated how the undercover officers conducted the relationships right through to the exit strategies, which I've touched upon, that they used to bring the relationships to an end. These demonstrate beyond doubt the, the systematic and strategic nature of these intimate relationships. As mentioned, mirroring was a technique used by undercover officers to groom women. So Andy Coles, for example, told some of Jessica's friends that he'd been adopted like her. Mark Kennedy liked country music when he was pursuing Kate, then drum and bass when he was pursuing Lisa. He claimed to have grown up in South West, Lo West London like Kate when seeking a relationship with her. And then when courting C, he told her that when he was growing up, he'd spent time at the same local park in Norwich that she'd gone to as a child. James Straven told Ellie that he was born in Amman and she had lived in Jordan. And with Sarah, Sarah, he shared her spiritual journey. There's clear evidence that the officers would pass information to each other in order to facilitate mirroring. Some of the women have been able, in retrospect, to identify whether one undercover officer has fed personal information about her to a subsequent undercover officer that has then been used to groom her for a relationship. I'll give an example in relation to Rosa. She had told Jason Bishop at a land rights occupation some time before she met Jim Boiling how she'd drawn strength from a particular view of the spirituality of trees when going through a difficult time as a teenager. Later, with Boiling, he mirrored to her the exact same thoughts as if they were his own. Rose is sure this was done to manipulate her into thinking that there was a special connection between them. And the only source of that information could have been John Bishop. Similarly, C believes that information obtained from her by another undercover officer, Rod Richardson, during a climbing trip in 2003, and it must be remembered that she met him in 2009, was fed to Mark Kennedy for use when he targeted her, to, to her for a relationship all that time later. Likewise, Rod Richardson knew both Kate and Lisa well, and knew of Lisa's passion for climbing. It can't have been a coincidence that Mark Kennedy, who succeeded Richardson in infiltrating the Nottingham group, turned up with a cover story of being a rope access technician and a keen recreational climber and mountaineer who wanted to be near Stanage Edge. A further common technique was emotional manipulation to draw on the women's empathy and build trust. For example, Carlo Neri used stories of mental health problems and domestic abuse in his childhood with Donna. Mark Kennedy claimed he'd been deeply damaged by his father having left home when he was a child and that he'd been bullied at school due to a stutter and a lazy eye. John Dines pretended that he'd lost both of, both of his parents to build his relationship with Helen and wrote to her describing the funeral. He also told her he'd been the bit victim of physical abuse from his mother and pretended to have learned that the man he grew up believing to be his father was not in fact so. Rob Harrison told Meyer that he'd been emotionally neglected by his mother and ran away from home as a teenager before finishing school, after which he became estranged from her. Mark Jenner told Allison that his father was killed by a drunk driver when he was eight years old. What's notable about this story is that Andy Coles had previously had a relationship with Jessica, whose brother was killed by a drunk driver when she was 11 years old. And according to Peter Francis, undercover officers were trained to go into the field by the cohort who had just been deployed. Mark Jenner was deployed after Andy Coles. And so the obvious question arises as to whether Andy Coles worked with Mark Jenner to build his legend. In grooming Jessica, Ellie and Helen Steele, Andy, Cold, Andy Coles, James Straven and John Dines all took advantage of the women's young age and all three men lied about their own ages to reduce 
the appearance of an age gap. Most of the women described the man they had a relationship with as being extremely attentive and supportive and quickly cultivating a deep connection with them. For example, Belinda says of her relationship with Bob Lambert, the relationship was passionate and romantic. He often told me that he loved me and he missed me when we were apart. He gave me the impression he wanted to be with me all the time and forever. By getting to know my family and the way he confided in me about my feelings and his psyche, he made me believe the relationship was genuine. I saw him very frequently. We practically lived together from the start and spent six months living together as a couple in a shared flat with others. Donna tells of the intensity of her relationship with Carlo. He asked me to marry him on New Year's Eve 2002, three months after we met. We spent time discussing our wedding plans, including the venue, the music, the guests and the food. He promised to buy a ring, which never materialised. He said very early in the relationship that he wanted to have a baby with me. John Dines was equally demonstrative and romantic with Helen. John sent me lots of love letters, Valentine cards. He talked to me about wanting to have lots of children with me because he was an only child. He sent me poetry he'd written himself, made plans with me to buy a plot of land, grow our own food, start a family. He said he pictured us growing old together on the veranda, looking into the sunset. Finally, as noted, there were also striking similarities in the exit strategies of many of the undercover officers. Straven told Sarah that his friend had committed suicide following sexual abuse. John Dines, Mark Jenner, Jim Boylan, Carlo Neri and Mark Kennedy all faked mental breakdown. For example, John Dines told Helen that his dad wasn't his real dad, that his mum had never loved him, that he threw all his mum's jewellery in the river and that his mother had physically abused him, including slashing him with a knife. He said the only he thought, the only person he thought had ever really cared for him had left him. This was his ex-girlfriend. And that this was why he never trusted that Helen would not abandon him, leaving him alone again in the world. The similarities in the devices used inexorably points to the deliberate use of relationships as one means by, by which undercover officers were permitted or encouraged to do their job. It was a tactic. I want now to say something about the MPS response since the scandal broke. The MPS has been at pains to emphasize in its opening statement how keen it is to co cooperate with the inquiry. But as has been repeatedly demonstrated, in the opening statements of other non-state court participants who've already addressed you, sir, their conduct in the course of this inquiry gives the lie to that. But this isn't anything new. It is more of the same. This is what the MPS has been doing from the outset, from the moment it was forced to engage with the civil claims brought by the eight women, uh, by eight of the women, and it is continuing to this day, not just in relation to the inquiry, but in relation to Kate Wilson's IPT claim, which is still going on. And what follows is going to be a little dry, and I apologise for that, but I want to summarise the positions adopted by the MPS in the civil litigation, first in the High Court, latterly in the IPT claim, because I want to illustrate the extent of resistance on the part of the MPS to make disclosure because it again highlights the importance of the inquiry as a public inquiry, ensuring that the full facts are brought to light. These obstructive tactics have also prolonged and compounded the harm already caused to the women by the deceptive relationships. In particular, I ask that the inquiry considers carefully the important points that Kate Wilson has been able to raise in the IPT proceedings, even on the highly, highly selected, redacted disclosure that she's been given to date. These are points which the MPS has made abundantly clear it is not going to volunteer and which the inquiry is unlikely to be able to identify of its own motion because it just doesn't have the first-hand knowledge of the underlying events. If the inquiry is serious 
in its pursuit of the truth. It must, must enable the other side of the story to be heard. And this requires disclosure to be made, not merely in fragmented categories, but so as to enable those affected to identify patterns and themes and to be in a position to raise relevant points on which to test the evidence. And of particular importance is the release to the women of their personal pink or registry files held by special branch, since only they will be able to spot the information in there which was used or collated in the course of the undercover officer's deceptive relationship. So turning to the history of the civil litigation, it began in October 2011 in relation to three women who brought a claim against Mark Kennedy. And because this was a claim that arose uh, out of events taking place after 2000, they were able to claim both at common law and under the Human Rights Act. The NPS initially agreed in correspondence that it was going to make disclosure in response to the claims, but that was suddenly withdrawn. And instead, in June of 2012, they applied to strike the claim out on the grounds that it needed to be brought in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal because only that tribunal had jurisdiction to consider the Human Rights Act claims. Now, that tribunal, the Investigatory, Power, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, is one which historically had operated almost entirely in secret, leaving those who made a complaint uh, to it utterly in the dark as to what material was being con considered or the basis of any finding, upholding or dismissing their complaint. In other words, what the MPS were trying to do was to have the whole case dealt with in secret. Now, some months after they responded to, uh, sorry, some months after that, they then responded to a letter of claim which was sent on behalf of Rosa, Helen, Alison, Belinda and Ruth, who had all had relationships before 2000. And so they sought to bring a claim based only on the common law. And for the first time, they, the police, raised the notion or the principle of NCND, neither confirm nor deny. And they said that they could neither confirm nor deny the basis of the claims and they refused to make any disclosure. And they then repeated that stance when they uh, later issued their defence when the claim was finally issued. Now, the attempts to have the claim determined in the IPT failed and the Court of Appeal ultimately held that, yes, the Human Rights Act claims had to be determined in the IPT, but the common law claims were going to continue in the High Court. And so next, what the MPS did was to seek to strike out both sets of proceedings on the ground that it could not defend them because it could neither confirm nor deny anything about them. Strikingly, it took that stance in relation to the claim re relating to Mark Kennedy, even though the MP MPS accepted it was pointless and unrealistic neither to confirm nor deny that Kennedy was a police officer who had been authorised to act undercover, not least because the MPS themselves had confirmed this already in the media, but they still tried to strike out the claim. Shortly before the hearing of that application, they withdrew the application to strike out, but instead uh, uh, maintained their position of neither confirming nor denying anything about the claim. So they were effectively saying the claim can continue, but we are not going to say anything about it. So as a result, it was then left to the women to challenge their reliance upon a stance of neither confirming nor denying. Um, anything about the claim. And that was very strongly defended. It went to a hearing. And in July of 2014, the High Court judge ruled against the MPS and said, you cannot rely on NCND in respect of the entirety of your claim. As a result of which, they had to, in the claim brought by those women uh, uh, for, for events, for, for relationships before 2000, they had to uh, amend their defence. And in summary, they did admit that Jim Boiling and Bob Lambert were undercover officers and that they had had relationships with Rosa, Ruth and Belinda Harvey, but they made the dishonest assertion that the relationships occurred because of mutual attraction and genuine personal feelings between the two officers and the women. 
they made the extraordinary denial that the officers had used deceit with the intention that Rosa, Ruth and Belinda Harvey should enter into long-term sexual relationships. They made the extraordinary denial that the officers had abused their power or that they'd acted unlawfully. And they admitted that the defendant's guidance uh, advised the use of fleeting sexual relationships if necessary, but they divide, denied that supervising officers had expressly authorised or tacitly acquiesced in long-term intimate relationships in general or in the claimant's relationships in particular. And then in relation to John Dines and Mark Jenner, they continued to maintain a complete NCND stance. So the next option for the MPS was to try to get out of the proceedings as quickly as they could. So they made what's called a part 36 offer. They offered to pay damages, which is the only thing that effectively one can get through a civil claim. It wasn't accepted. So they next invited mediation to take place. And that took place um, in uh, December of 2014 for the women whose claims related to events before 2000. And then there was a further mediation in June of 2015 in relation to those who had had relationships with Kennedy. It wasn't until May of 2015, so shortly before that Kennedy mediation, that they served a defence in relation to the Kennedy claim. And in that defence, they admitted that Kennedy was an undercover officer, but they made no admissions whatsoever in relation to the women's case that they'd entered into intimate relationships with him. And in light of that non-admission, they said nothing whatever, obviously, about whether or not the supervisors knew or authorised him to have those relationships. Finally, in November of 2015, all of the claims, bar those of Kate Wilson, were settled and the MPS issued a public apology. Uh, so that apology is reproduced in full in our written submissions. I know that it's also in the MPS's written submissions in full, and so I'm not going to take you to it. But in summary, its terms accepted that the behaviour of a number of police officers working for the SDS and the NPOIU had been totally unacceptable and described the relationships with the women as abusive, deceitful, manipulative and wrong. And they were also accepted to be a violation of the women's human rights and an abuse of power. So contrast very strongly with the way in which they had defended the claim earlier. In summary, they said that whilst these relationships should not have happened, they were not authorised, they would never be authorised in advance, nor indeed used as a tactic of deployment. And if an officer did have sexual, a sexual relationship, he was required to report it. And the fact that the relationships had occurred was attributed to failures of supervision and management and lack of appropriate insight. I note in passing that the officers represented by Slater and Gordon deprecate the apology, and they do so on the clear basis that these relationships were known about and were authorised in some way. And they also, as I've noted, continue to argue that such relationships are fully justified in the context of policing environmental and justice camp movements. I also note that the designated lawyers officers appear too to suggest that casual sexual encounters are justifiable, again contradicting the stated position of the Metropolitan Police Service in its, in its apology. So coming back to the history of the proceedings, as noted, the settlement announced in November 2015 didn't include Kate Wilson's claim and she pressed on with her claim because she wanted to continue with her attempt to get disclosure. So all that was then left to the MPS to do was what it did next, which was to withdraw its defence to the claim. Because the next step for the MPS in the proceedings, the next step which it could not avoid if they were to continue, was disclosure. So having effectively, no, not effectively, having completely withdrawn its defence to the claim, um, that claim did then settle because there was nothing that could continue. But it didn't settle on any terms that prevented Kate from continuing to pursue her Human Rights Act claims in the IPT. And that's what she next proceeded to do. Now, in the IPT, the MPS has continued 
to seek to avoid disclosure at all costs, exactly as it did in the High Court. First of all, it sought to strike the claim out completely on the basis that it was out of time. And then it made a number of admissions, hoping that this would be enough to prevent either to get the claim stopped or to avoid the need for disclosure. But when that failed, it then withdrew some of the admissions, although the admission that the sexual relationship amounted to inhuman and degrading treatment in breach of Article 3 is one that remains. In its defence, the MPS admitted, among other things, that Kennedy's cover officer had been aware that Kennedy was conducting a close relationship uh, with Kate and should have been aware that it was a sexual relationship. It then served an amended defence in which further admissions were made, including that additional officers, that is Kennedy's cover officers in plural and the line manager, were aware of his close relationship with Kate and that they ought to have known it was a sexual relationship and that they acquiesced, that, and that they acquiesced in that relationship. In the course of these proceedings, 10,000 pages of close material were provided not to Kate, but to the tribunal. And Kate was then provided with a tiny sample of around 200 pages uh, in order that a protocol could be agreed about how to redact the documents. Now, as I noted, when the attempts to avoid disclosure failed, the MPS then served a further uh, amended defence, which withdrew some of the admissions it had made. And it, it included in that withdrawal was that anyone other than Kennedy's principal cover officer knew or ought to have known about the relationship and that there were systematic failings. So that whole acquiescence admission went. On the same date, the MPS served a witness statement from Sir Stephen House who is a deputy commissioner of the MPS. Now he had no first-hand knowledge at all about the material, but his witness statement was aimed at providing an account of his interpretation drawn from the 10,000 documents that had been disclosed. And Kate objected to this. And she made a further witness statement critiquing his analysis as a result of which uh, the IPT directed that certain categories of document should be reviewed by Council to the tribunals, uh, uh, council to the tribunal, and later directed Sir Stephen House to produce a further witness statement, which council to the tribunal was then to, from which council to the tribunal was then to determine which of a schedule of documents were to be disclosed to Cade. Cases now had about twenty percent, some two thousand of the underlying evidence. Um, very heavily redacted, as I mentioned, but the implications are grave. Firstly, it's become clear that the documents present very significant difficulties for any legal team or witness who is trying to interpret the material if they weren't involved in the events at the time. So, for example, lawyers representing the Metropolitan Police and the National Police Chiefs Council wrote on the 9th of October in relation to ciphering and redacting, it is not possible merely by looking at the schedule materials and how people have been variously referred to and or described to guarantee that incorrect ciphering doesn't occur. Anyone now looking at the materials without having additional information available to them will not easily and accurately be able to apply an individual cipher for each separate person. Ms Wilson, on the other hand, has been able to identify examples of un unauthorised overseas deployments, significant misrepresentation of groups and individuals, and extremely inaccurate reporting of events, as well as major failures in the authorisation process and in oversight and management. In addition, evidence that senior officers must have been aware of the relationship. Sexist attitudes and political prejudices are evident throughout the material. And as Miss Wilson stated in her submissions to the tribunal, the defendant appears to have adopted a thought crime approach to breaching people's rights, repeatedly stating that anyone they considered to be a like-minded individual was a legitimate target. And that as a consequence, the risk of collateral, collateral intrusion was low. One authorization goes so far as to say, the secretive nature of the subject group 
is such that any person present during the deployment is within the membership of that group. This sentence cleverly makes anyone who comes into contact with Mark Kennedy, by definition, a target of the operation, presumably removing any possible risk of collateral intrusion. Finally, and as a direct result of that disclosure process, the police are now admitting that not only Mark Kennedy and his principal cover officer, but also Jim Boiling, Jason Bishop, Rod Richardson, Lynn Watson, and Marco Jacobs all violated Kate's Article 8 right to privacy. The police had spent three years robustly resisting any investigation of the facts of those Article 8 breaches on the grounds that they were insignificant before it finally made that admission. And David Perry, who was counsel to the MPS and the MPCC in the IPT, described the facts underlying the omission as ugly. However, the specific basis for the sudden change of position hasn't yet been explained to Kate. But it should be noted that the contact Ms Wilson had with these other officers was not intimate or sexual. So far from being insignificant, therefore, this admission has implications for hundreds of other individuals who were subject to similar disproportionate interference with their Article 8 rights. The original position adopted by the MPS prior to the legal principles ruling, and I'm turning now to its approach in the inquiry, was that it should be permitted to maintain its stance of NCND in all public aspects of the inquiry and that all police evidence should be heard in closed proceedings. Following Sir Christopher Pitchard's uh, rejection of that approach, the start of the substantive hearings has now been delayed for a further four and a half years dealing with application after application for anonymity, anonymity and redactions to documents. The refusal of the MPS to release all the cover names of officers means that those officers' assertions relating to their conduct will go unchallenged by those on whom they were spying. And that some women may never find out that they too were deceived into relationships by state agents, or indeed that they bore children from those operations. And nor will such children know. Finally, as a result of the refusal of the vast majority of officers and former officers to give evidence in their real names, very often on grounds of privacy, thereby precluding the proceedings from being broadcast, only a tiny number of non-state core participants and members of the public will be able to see or hear the evidence being given. Contrary to the way the MPS has presented itself in opening, this entire history does not suggest an organisation that is ready to be open and frank about its failings. Rather, it demonstrates an organisation that remains desperate not to account, let alone to account publicly for the terrible damage it has permitted its officers to do to the women. It's fundamentally wrong that an organisation which has admitted significant human rights breaches over an extended period of time is allowed to have so much influence and control over both the extent of the information released to those who were subjected to the abuses and the speed of the public inquiry into those abuses. Finally, I'm going to address, sir, the women's hopes and concerns for this inquiry. Their need for answers is no less burning now than it was when they first suspected or learned the truth. They need answers about what was done to them and why, who authorised, condoned or acquiesced in it, who knew about it, what information was shared and recorded about them and what will be done to stop it happening to others. Their need to understand is a deeply human one, one that we can all relate to. Until they have answers to their questions, there cannot be any resolution for them. The impact of the abuse will continue. They need to know whether they were deliberately targeted by the state, 
and if so, why? They need to know whether they were, I apologize, they need to know whether personal information about their most intimate lives is still on a file somewhere. The Bob Lambert report, this was a report in which Mike Chitty was referenced as having a treasured collection relating to Lizzie of love letters and photographs that were kept in a locked box or the disclosure made to Kate in the IPT. These suggest that there probably is a great deal of such information. They need definitive answers that they can have confidence in as to whether anyone else in their lives was an undercover police officer and they need to know it won't happen again. This need has been recognised repeatedly by many of the psychiatrists and psychologists who've assessed the women over the years since the scandal broke. Dr Brock Chisholm, a clinical, chartered clinical psychologist, wrote as far back in February 2013 in respect of the recommended treatment and prognosis for the significant psychiatric injuries caused to Alison by her relationship with Mark Jenner. The most helpful, helpful thing for Alison would be to learn the truth so that she can make sense of what was true and what was not, as well as make a judgment about the continuing threat or likelihood of being monitored. It would also give meaning and allow her to resolve the loss of Mark. Dr Chisholm talks about the difficulty in engaging in therapy without knowing the extent to which Alison's fears about what may be true are actually the case. It's debatable about what was true and what wasn't true. The term delusion is a value statement about the beliefs that a person holds being outside what most people believe is true. However, it appears likely that some of what Alison believed was correct, even though most others thought she was deluded. Dr. Georgina Smith, a specialist clinical research psychologist, wrote in respect of Kate in July, 2015, the lack of disclosure has left Kate with numerous unanswered questions, many related to her own identity and self-esteem, whether or not she was targeted, whether or not her relationship with Mark was closely monitored, to what extent their relationship and the things they did together were determined by the Metropolitan Police. In the absence of these answers, she is left running, ruminating and imagining possible scenarios resulting in an inability to move on. And from this, Oh, sorry, to move on from this, and a tendency due to her psychiatric injury to imagine the worst case scenarios, which can in turn exacerbate her psychological difficulties. The women continue to participate in the inquiry, but the hope they had at the outset that they're here, they will finally be given the answers they need, has diminished to the point of vanishing. They continue because they remain impelled to find the truth and to prevent these abuse, abuses happening to any other women. And this latter imperative is all the greater, given that there appears to be no criminality arising from these deceptions in light of the divisional court's judgment last year, I think it was earlier this year, in the case of Monica and the DPP. And that was a judicial review brought against the DPP's decision not to prosecute Jim Boiling for offences of rape and uh, abuse in public office. I note at this point the self-pity voiced on behalf of Jim Boiling by Mr Whittam in his opening statement that a complaint of rape was made against him. Now whether or not the law labels as rape intercourse which my clients did not consent to because it was based on a fundamental deception as to who the person was that they were having sex with, they experienced the profound violation of their bodies that took place as rape. So Jim Boyley and all the other officers should stop feeling this disgusting self-pity. Instead, they should feel exceedingly lucky that the criminal law appears to view rape through such a profoundly male-centred gaze. Another reason why this inquiry remains so important as a vehicle to get to the truth is that there's no explicit guidance in Reaper protocols and a wholesale failure 
to address the issue of sexual relationships in the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Criminal Conduct Bill. This bill is currently making its way through Parliament. Indeed, one of the tragedies of the delay of this inquiry is the resulting in inability to feed into that process and the debates. The women have waited for over five years and barring the heavily redacted Tradecraft Manual, they've received no significant disclosure. They've repeatedly requested it, a particular of their personal files, in order they can begin the process of grappling with what, or isn't it, what, with what is or isn't in them, but they've been told that this is an unhelpful distraction, I put in quotes, from the work of the inquiry, a response that the women find deeply insulting and insensitive. The extent and scope of the restriction orders granted to officers means they are never likely to know the full extent of the intrusion into their lives, how many other officers in, were involved in their lives or knew of the relationships. They are deeply concerned about the lack of access to the inquiry hearings, both for themselves for the public as well, and that the inquiry's approach to the restriction of cover names and its refusal to publish photographs of undercover officers and the names of all the groups that were spied upon mean that many of those who have relevant evidence to give will simply not know to come forward. It's telling that neither Lizzie nor Sarah would have known to come forward if the inquiry hadn't contacted them. Other women who've had relationships have been identified because People who know them or know of them are already core participants in the inquiry. It's very likely that there are others, especially where cover names have been restricted, and they will never know to come forward. And this matters greatly because, as I've said, the inquiry's ability to assess the extent of the abuses that occurred is limited if those who would be able to bring those abuses to light can't do so. It's profoundly wrong to re rely on the assertion of an individual officers that they didn't engage relationships because we know that they have lied. I gave the example of Straven. And as the women have repeatedly emphasized, being in a long-term or apparently happy marriage is no guarantee whatsoever that officers didn't betray their wives and engage in deceptive relationships whilst they were undercover. At the heart of what happened to these women is, as I've said, institutional sexism. Mr Barr himself recognised that one of the questions the inquiry must engage with and must answer is whether targeting was influenced by sexism. It's a complex issue. It requires an exploration, not just of the mindset of the men involved in the undercover units, but also of the institutional culture that developed and operated and how the two interrelated. But that exploration doesn't take place in a vacuum. The assessment of evidence, especially the testimony of witnesses, that depends upon evaluation and judgment, both of which are profoundly influenced by a tapestry of experience and belief, which are not objective. And that subjectivity affects not only the assessment of whether what the witness describes discloses sexism, but also of the credibility of the witness himself. The women fully endorse the points made in the opening statement on behalf of John Burke Monoville, Patricia Amana De Silva and Mark Wadsworth in respect of race. And I know, sir, you have that written statement and I'm going to uh, speak orally to it later this afternoon. And in the women's submission, those comments and observations about race apply equally in respect of sex. The women have already expressed their deep concern that the inquiry doesn't have the expertise and breadth of experience to tackle this issue in a truly penetrating way. And that concern comes from the very narrow life experiences of you, sir, a life which means that you have never had to confront these issues, either in your life or your work, as corroborated by your having to reflect on your expressed assumptions about a lengthy marriage, making it unlikely that an undercover officer would have engaged in sexual relationships whilst undercover. Your background is typical of the higher judiciary. Like many higher high court, court of appeal, Supreme Court judges, you've been a member of the Garrett Club, 
which expressly excludes women from membership. And no doubt you don't see that as a, as a problem. But as Baroness Hale stated in 2015 of many of her colleagues in the Supreme Court, who also belonged to the Barrett Grub Club and didn't see what the fuss was about, this is quite shocking. And she went on to observe that judges should be committed to the principle of equality for all. The women's concerns also come from a lack of sensitivity in the inquiry's failure to recognize the urgency of the need for disclosure in the case of the women. From the manner in which Lizzie and Sarah were notified that men had had intimate relationships, men they had had intimate relationships with were undercover officers, and the manner in which it left to the women, left it to the women who had had relationships with Carly, Carl O'Neary, Anthony Lewis, and James Straven to decide whether or not to reveal the real names, something um, which was the responsibility of the inquiry to decide upon. And in the case of Carlo Neri, from preventing Donna from this morning in this opening statement, naming him and forcing me to, to make an undertaking in order that this opening statement might be given live. And from the stark contrast between the time taken by the inquiry and the care shown for the privacy and concerns of former undercover officers as compared with the lack of time taken and the lack of care shown for the same interests and concerns of the non-state core participants. The women would again urge you to seek assistance from those with experience and expertise on issues of sex discrimination, not only at the lessons learned stage, but crucially at the fact finding stage. You have mistakenly assumed that fact finding is a wholly objective exercise. And even if you genuinely believe that you can re reach an objective judgment on the facts, you should, sir, be open to the possibility that your experiences in life and the beliefs that they've given rise to will shape your judgment, as they will for any person, and that those experiences don't give you the monopoly on the truth. You should be open to the possibility that others with different life experiences might be able to see things that you simply cannot, and that adding these different perspectives to the mix might help the inquiry to get to the truth. Openness to the possibility is all the more urgent in this inquiry, precisely because of the one sided untestable accounts that will inevitably be received from the police because of the restriction orders granted to the officers, because of the fact they will be giving evidence in secret. Were you to accept this possibility and proceed accordingly, the inquiry would unquestionably regain a measure of credibility and the process could begin of restoring the women's trust in it. As stated, they remain involved because they are impelled to know the truth and stop this happening again to other women, but the cost of their doing so is incalculable and it is important that the inquiry fully understands this. Some women have already suffered the deep distress of repeatedly living, reliving the deception to which they were subjected. They were forced to discuss matters deeply private and personal with lawyers and psychiatrists in the civil proceedings. And all the women with this inquiry face this prospect, either again or for the first time. And none of them want to do this. They would much rather not. It has already been a deeply painful and exposing process. Just putting together this opening statement has been so painful to them. And it's gonna get much worse. And they have already experienced so much stress because of the way the process has unfolded. For those women who haven't been able to pursue a remedy in the civil courts, this inquiry is the only able, available avenue of redress for them. For those women who were deceived by Mark Kennedy, they've had to go through the stress of preparing this opening statement in the lead up to the 10 year anniversary of their discovery about the truth that occurred on the 21st of October. This just underscores how long it has taken to get to this point. All the women need to be shown by this inquiry that it recognizes and that it appreciates what they are going through 
in order to help this inquiry get to the truth. They need it to press ahead with disclosure and not keep them waiting any longer. And to this end, they seek full disclosure of all records on file about them and of any and all policies or references to intimate sexual relationships by these units. At the outcome of this inquiry, and to make sure this never happens again, they seek a recommendation Firstly, that the law is changed to prohibit undercover officers from engaging in intimate sexual relationships while in their undercover persona. That the police be required to suspend an officer and inform anyone deceived into a relationship with him as soon as they become aware of the relationship. And an end to the infiltration of campaign groups. So those are my opening submissions on behalf of my clients. Ms. Kaufman, um, thank you for the um, task that you've undertaken this morning. Uh, we will be seeing you again this afternoon. May I take this opportunity uh, to thank you and through you, those whom you represent uh, in this category for the detailed account that they have provided through your oral and written opening statements of their experiences and of their belief and the reasons for their belief that these were uh, not uh, the actions of um, individuals, but uh, the actions of a group of people with or without the knowledge of their superiors. The information that you've provided, the detail of it, is enormously helpful uh, to me in my task of getting to the truth about what occurred. Thank you.